personalized medicine in therapeutic side as well as on diagnostic side. Valirex is a small biotech company developing those personalized therapeutics. Companies got an portfolio in oncology for very innovative technologies and products coming from very good sources, Imperial College as well as Cancer Research UK. We always have worldwide rights for technology development as well as for commercialization. We are now progressively moving towards clinical phases. We are, our lead compound is now in phase one, phase two clinical study. And the good news is that approximately 75% of drug candidates in clinical studies are of biotech origin. And why is that? Pharmaceutical companies have started or already have closed their R&D departments. They don't do personalized approaches in the therapeutic side. They also, they also don't anymore do so much early phase clinical studies. And funny enough, they have realized that they actually need pipelines. Where do these future drugs come from or therapeutic approaches? Biotech companies. So here we are. Valirex business model is relatively simple. We screen technologies and products from institutions such as Cancer Research UK or Imperial College. We have very rigorous process for this and these technologies and products we in license need to have commercial as well as technological proof of concept. Sometimes it's very difficult to analyze the commercial potential for these early stage drugs, and, but, but there, there are some metrics we can use. We then develop these products, I call them products, or, although they are not products as such, at that stage, at a certain stage, usually what we call phase two. Then we look for partners, big pharmaceutical companies, to either collaborate with us, or co-develop these, these products or license them. We have seen very nice deals during the last year, actually, for licensing as well as potential merger acquisition as well. Key achievements this far are we are now in phase one slash two clinical trials with our lead compound. These cancer trials have been established with UCLH, University College London Hospital, one of the best institutes and most respectable ones to do these kind of clinical studies. Val, what I call Val 401, I explain a bit more about these drugs later on, is the recent acquisition on the therapeutic side. This is for lung cancer indication. Lung cancer is a very huge unmet medical need. The lead compound, which is now in clinical studies is uh, for prostate cancer. What we call gene ice, development of gene ice. Gene ice is a platform for down-regulating what I call rebellious genes, the genes that work when they shouldn't be working or where they shouldn't be working, causing all sorts of problems such as cancer, some neurological indications and also inflammatory diseases. We, for this particular platform development, we got a very prestigious grant called Eurostars grant. First one was um, granted four years ago. We successfully completed the first part and got the second one about a year ago. We have all sorts of collaborations with leading institutions. We also, we, we touched about biomarkers, the previous talk. If biomarkers are the diagnostic tools which tell you which patient subpopulation is most likely to respond to your treatment. So we are developing those biomarkers together with our therapeutic products, just to make sure that the package is good. So when I go to pharmaceutical company, I can tell not only I have a world-class therapeutic product, but I also have a marker that you can use for maybe later 
clinical studies or when you are marketing the drug, telling you that this particular patient subpopulation is going to respond or potentially not respond. As we heard, usually only 30% of the population or patient population is going to respond to, to your, your treatment when we are talking about personalized medicine. We have, of course, obtained further funding for our programs. Our product pipeline looks like this. As I mentioned, the lead compound now for prostate cancer and potentially later on for breast cancer because this is a second indication, potential indication for this drug, is now in, uh, in clinical studies. Our lung cancer has completed the um, preclinical phase and we are currently talking to MHRA for potential clinical, clinical study. Well, 201, the lead compound, is a very interesting one insofar as this particular compound is against hormone-induced cancers as well as abnormal growth. Endometriosis is hormone-induced abnormal growth. It's not classified as, mm, as cancer. However, it can lead to endometrial cancer as well. But the mechanism is the same. And we have quite a lot of preclinical data showing that this particular compound can be used to treat endometriosis as well. Val 101 is what I called apoptosis inducer. This particular compound is based on our gene ice platform, the rebellious gene silencing platform. Cancer cells, apoptosis is um, induced cell death. Cancer cells are very clever and they are very fearsome warriors as well. Our bodies have cancerous growth all the time. Quite often, well, most of the time, so your body understands that this particular cell is rebellious, it needs to be killed. But cancer cells are very clever. They use all sorts of mechanisms to overcome this particular thing. And this compound helps your body's cell to kill further those cells which are rebellious. And we have shown that this compound can be used potentially, this is very much preclinical study, pancreatic, breast cancer, prostate cancer, lung cancer indications. NAV3 is a cancer biomarker which goes together with our clinical studies. I mentioned Genome's discovery platform, which is for rebellious genes. Okay, VAL201, which is now in clinical studies for prostate cancer, is, as I said, against hormone, refractory, and metastatic tumors in this case. Now we have phase one, phase two clinical study ongoing. We are going now to dose escalation. What I mean by one slash two clinical study, I explain it a bit more because this is very important. When we started to talk to regulators, in this case MHRA, they had to look at our toxicology data from preclinical studies. They came back and said, it looks very good. And don't worry about healthy volunteers. Forget about them because tox data looks very good this far. Go directly to the patient population and <clears throat> come back with a protocol for phase one slash dose escalation phase two. So we were hip hurrah, yes, thank you. Of course it meant to define the protocol and it took a bit more time, but in this case, of course, you, at the end of the day, you save a lot of time and save a lot of money as well. So that's where we are now. This is for patients with locally advanced and or metastatic tumors. And we have now first successful data announced about uh, safety. And now we are going to more tolerability and those escalation phases. I always say to investors, invest on a red line. I know that investors don't like red, but in this case it's good news because it shows 
that when you treat the cancer models with our compound, you don't get a tumor growth anymore, so tumor doesn't grow. Xenocraft means that you actually induce a tumor, so there is the start of the tumor. But if you give them placebo or nothing, the tumor grows. We are not restricted on the market size because the prostate cancer market is now about 7 billion, and I mentioned about endometriosis, which is another big market, about 2 billion. And unfortunately, quite a few of those in the audience have a very good chance of developing a prostate cancer if you are lucky enough to live, live um, at a quite old age. I won't, but there is a breast cancer as well. Mind you, I had an investor once, I met investor once, when I said, I won't, he asked, why? And I didn't know what to say. We all sort of fell over from our chairs with giggles, and he was like, what, did I say something funny? Like, no, that's fine. No worries. About the metastatic, we already heard that metastatic growth is, is, is lethal, kind of, especially in a case of prostate cancer, where these, these cancer cells are very promiscuous, which is fair enough, they are prostate cancer cells. However, this is not good news for a patient. Quite often these cells find their, they leave home, they go around, find their way to other places in the body, quite often in a bone. Not good news. We have shown that VAL201, which is now in clinical studies for prostate cancer, also has a potential to reduce this metastatic growth. In our preclinical studies, we have shown up to 50% reduction of metastatic movement, if you like, and growth, which is good news for the patients as well. So not only this compound can treat the actual primary tumor, but also reduce the metastatic growth, or at least the movement to the next site. Well, <clears throat> sorry. Well, 401, which has an indication for, for lung cancer, is actually a reformulated drug. This drug has been in the market <clears throat> for about 15 years, so there's a lot of safety and tolerability data already, which we are going to use. We have now completed the preclinical studies, and we hope to get a fast track to maybe even phase two study, because we have lots of um, tolerability data already for this drug. This is, as I said, for lung cancer treatment, in this case for non-small cell lung cancer. This is, a, again, a cancer model data showing that when you administer our compound, the cancer cells stop growing, but when you don't give anything, the cancer cells grow. Rebellious genes, genize. Genize is gene inactivation by chromatin engineering, or gene ice, or freezing the genes. This took a couple of bottles of wine to come up with this, but anyway, so it's gene ice, freezes the genes. As I said, inappropriate activity of the gene, when or where, if it's not appropriate, causes a lot of problems. This technology allows us to design molecules which find those genes, bind them specifically. You have to design the specific probe to do that. Anyway, that's another matter. And then closes down the gene. So physically, the gene cannot be active anymore. The approach is well established in the scientific literature, but actually developing those molecules wasn't a trivial exercise. Our first gene, um, Europe, Eurostars grant, was actually awarded for optimizing the develop, um, production of these molecules. Again, a picture showing the same thing. If you administer our compound to the cancer models, cancer doesn't grow, and if you don't give anything, the cancers grow, or cancer cells in this case. Biomarkers 
are actually very important when you talk about personalized medicine. And as I said already, we are developing those markers specifically together with our therapeutic, different therapeutic approaches to make sure that when you go to clinical trials, you have a right patient population. You can also monitor the progression of, of the disease when you administer your drug. So we are developing those. We recently made an acquisition of very interesting technology, which gives you an idea of when we get those cancer cells from, from the gentleman, we can analyze those cells, or we have a method to analyze those cells for special biomarkers, which then we can use for our therapeutic approach. Value chain for biotech companies like ourselves is quite simple. Academia doesn't talk to pharma company, companies. Pharma companies, notoriously bad, talking to academia. And we are now there in between. We are like a link, a glue between those two. And whilst being a link and a glue, we also create a lot of value and make a lot of money because pharma companies are actually willing to pay quite a bit for a good pipeline. Biotech industry is now, if not mature, but more mature than a couple of years back, and we know what we are doing these days, pretty much. Not pretty much, we do. Our partners are world-class always. Cancer Research UK, Imperial College, University College London Hospital, and this one I can't uh, pronounce, but I will say German company, German Cancer Institute, okay? Eurostars Consortium, I touched. We are the leaders of this Eurostars Consortium. And then we have a couple of others as well. Board of Directors, you can read the bi biographies. We have all the relevant expertise and PhDs and also financial understanding. We have a lawyer in our board as well, which is very, very useful because he can practice in UK as well as in US. So, as a summary, Valirex is developing personalized therapeutics for several indications. We have a pipeline which has a huge potential to address large and growing market because, as we heard before, the cancer incidents are unfortunately growing, growing, growing because we live longer but also because the diagnostics tools are better. So we can actually diagnose those problems much better and much quicker and much earlier. So having good personalized therapeutics, when you, when you can actually diagnose a problem at a relatively early stage, if you have a good therapeutics, you have a very good chance to actually survive and live and die of old age. So we have several drug candidates going to clinical trials, and now one already there, so we have shown that we can actually do this. We can take the drugs from preclinical to clinical studies. Eurostars program is ongoing. We have progress in biomarkers and companion diagnostics development, very important part of this package when you go to your big pharmaceutical company and say, pay a lot of money for my, my package and my technology. We have done selective acquisitions. We, of course, grow our IP portfolio as we speak. So we get grants every now and again in a normal process. We file new patents as we get new results, and then they get granted in a due course. We are a listed company, and since 2006, our stock is relatively liquid. It's actually very liquid for various reasons. So that's good for a retail investor, in that sense. And our contact details are here. When you want to invest, there are two people who are very willing to talk to you. Or if you want some more information, of course. Or if you want to know about cancer industry or oncology industry. Thank you.
Any questions, anybody? Any hands up? Gentleman at the back. Are you, Chris? Evening, I'm an, an existing shareholder in your company. Um, in relation to Val 401, um, you previously announced via um, an RNS in January, it was a pivotal trial you were looking for. Um, pivotal trial, I imagine, is late stage. Um, and I just wondered if that's the case, and if so, are partners potentially, uh, what's your plan in relation to partners and funding that trial? We are looking for partners of course, all the time. So we are talking to various companies about several possibilities. No names then? No clues? Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm a CEO of a listed company. What do I ask? <laughs> I will let, I'm the first one to let you know. <laughs> Trust you, me. Or personally, or <laughs> on an RNS. <laughs> I will put RNSs out and they will come okay. out of your... Okay, and just, just Okay, just in relation to the pivotal trial aspect, um, you've obviously put that in your, your RNS, and I just wonder, you're clearly speaking to MHRA around it, but is, is your plan for a pivotal trial um, compared to a, a phase two? That's, well, yes, is the answer. However, I can't talk on behalf of the regulator, and we are, as, as you know, we are in a dialogue with MIHRA. What they come up with, I don't want to speculate because regulator, be it financial regulator or clinical regulator, is always a bit unknown based, as we know. Oh, oh of course, we know pretty much how they work, but you can't, you can't speculate the response, really. Another question at the back. Uh, yes, Satu. Um, with regards to the merger and acquisitions, um, there's been $18 billion worth of M&A activity in the first three months of this year in the US. Mm. Is that a market that you would look to tap into rather than sort of a UK or European-based? Of course we are looking, yes. Because there's more money in the US for this kind of activity. As we know, I mean, it's a fact, it's not my opinion. And more companies as well. So we are looking for US markets as well as UK markets, as well as Central European markets. Okay, and so the answer is yes, that would be, uh, that, that's, a, that's a big market for M&A at the moment. And there's a huge appetite for biotech. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of those deals were biotechs uh, mm -hmm. or involved biotechs as well. Yeah. Um, on 401, you, you've just mentioned you are talking to companies with regards to the funding of the pivotal trials. Th that's what we, well, yes, of course we are. Okay. But that's, that's our business model. So it's not a big secret that we are talking to potential co-development partners, licensing partners, because that's what we do. That's our business model. Take this from there, do this, talk to pharmaceutical companies or, or other biotech companies. That, that's the business model, and that's what we do actively. Especially now when, when you are in a preclinical state, you, still, you start talking to these companies, and they say either we are not in that field, which is fine if they are not in that field, that's fair enough. Or they say, that looks very interesting, but at that stage they say, it's too early. We want to see some sort of clinical evidence. Or, or, you, or you can sell it for tenor, which is not a best way of increasing shareholder value, I think. So when you are in sort of talking about clinics and you are a biotech company like ourselves, you are talking to several companies. You go to conferences, you talk to them, you present the... the scientific presentation or clinical presentation and see what comes up. And, and just leading on from that, if you don't mind, I mean, last September, October, both yourself um, and Dr. Morris, the COO, talked about um, potential um, uh, activity uh, with regards to uh, M&A um, or collaborations, licenses 
in the coming months, I think were the words you both used, is um, that activity ongoing? As I said, we started talking to companies at the preclinical stage for, for each of the compounds, and those dialogues are always ongoing. They are not short processes ever. And of course, we can't, we can't mention any names, but, but we, yes, we are talking to companies all the time. And, and just one final thing, sorry, from there. Um, would you um, be declaring any CDAs um, in the near future with regards to um, those talks? You can't announce a CDA because that's confidentiality agreement, so by nature you can't announce it. But that's common, it's a common practice to have a CDA. I think I have about like this many CDAs. But Kumar knows better because he's filing them. Okay, so you but do... But you, you can't announce them because... Yeah, but, yeah. So, but you do have several CDAs then. Yes, we do. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sati. Any more questions on the floor? <coughs> Gentleman just down here. Just on your t 201. Um, is that in phase one? Phase one, yeah. Okay, not phase two. Um, we, have, we have a protocol for way phase one, phase two. Uh, phase 2A, which means we start with what you can call 1B and you then directly go to dose escalation. And in this okay. case, and this is the case in many oncology trials these days of similar nature, that the boundary between 1 and 2 yeah. is blurred because you, can, you have a cohort-based cohort study where you have first cohort, you analyze the cohort whether it's safe, Everybody feels happy. Then you have a second, and you decide the dose escalation process. And then when you start seeing anti-tumor efficacy, which you don't know when that happens because it's called trial, and that's that's why we do this. You go and see. Okay, now you can see anti-tumor activity. Whether you see it in the second cohort, very unlikely, but I can always dream, or, or that. And then you get to the certain point where you can they to regulate, okay, but when the phase two started and phase one B finished, you don't have to So have, have you, have you reported so any, any data from those trials yet? And are you going to report toxicity data or we, efficacy data? Are we going to? Or are you going to report or have you reported toxicity data or efficacy data? Oh, we those? are going to, yeah, as we go along. We, Can you give we, us a timeline on that? Well, as I said, approximate. approximate timeline is when you have first cohort, second cohort, third cohort, you can report what happens. I know, I'm just asking you if yeah. you could, it could it be next year, is it going to be this year? No, it's no, no, we, we report probably on a, I, well, I can't tell you exactly when, but we have reported in on a sort of every other month basis, every month basis, or something like that. What, the toxicity data from the... No, tox the data is different. Tox data is gone, done. So you mean safety and tolerability data, uh, probably. Yeah. 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 We have announced the first report of safety data. Okay. A couple, when will of, we get, couple of months When ago. will we get any efficacy data? I don't know. When the patients... No, no. When the patients... Mm, well, if you're completing a phase two trial, you'll get efficacy from that, yes, won't you? Yes, but I can't, so you, I can't, should, predict, I can't you, predict how the patients are going to respond. I know you but can't, but you can tell how many patients are being recruited on an ongoing basis and when roughly you'll be able to report efficacy data from phase two trial. I'm not going to go into the Because you're, you, that. You, your academics will say, well, we've got 50 patients yeah, in this well, trial, exactly so we will have data by yeah. such and such. But I'm not going to talk on behalf of PI, which is principal investigate. I can't. Uh, out of interest, obviously you're in phase one, stroke two. When mm. do you think, will you be out of phase two in two years, three years? No, no, no. I know no, it's difficult no, to put a no. date on things, but... We anticipate to have a very good data packages um, by the end of the year. Okay. How they look like, I don't know, because it's, it's trial. But I can promise you that we will report and we will inform the markets on a regular basis. 
And any existing investors or potential investors obviously want to know what the exit strategy is. Mm. When are you going to become a tax exile? How many years? When is the business going to be sold, having completed its, its as, as I said, historically, pharmaceutical companies, I don't, or they can be a bigger bi biotech companies, or whichever, whichever, whatever is your strategic decision. When you start getting good phase one data, maybe early phase two data, if you can call efficacy data, say, they start being very interested, very interested indeed. And our, because our molecule is first in class. That's why I can't really predict how it is going to behave, because we don't know. We may see efficacy with the second patient, or it may, it may take, I don't know. It's a very novel molecule, but it's a very interesting molecule. Otherwise, UCLH wouldn't have been so interested. We'll watch the announcements with interest. Yeah, please do. Thank you, Santi. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.